I am Tony Fremont, Emeritus Professor of Pathology at the University of Manchester. It's a huge pleasure to be able to tell you something about what I believe is one of the most exciting advances in Egyptology, the use of proteomics to discover more about people and peoples living along the Nile Valley in antiquity. You have already heard from my colleague, Dr. Constantino Drossu, about DNA and its study, genomics. Proteomics is the study of another class of biomolecule called proteins. Proteins are doing molecules made by cells from DNA. So I would like to start by explaining the relationship between DNA and proteins. DNA is often called the blueprint of life. And that is a good starting place for thinking about DNA and proteins. If we look at the blueprint of a building, we can get a good idea about its structure and layout. But we have to go into the building to see exactly how each room looks decorated and furnished, information that could never be gleaned from just looking at the blueprint. Of course, there is no need for the room to have been decorated and furnished like this. Other inhabitants could have turned the bare shell into something very different based on their needs and likes. However, the blueprint would have been just the same no matter how the building was decorated or furnished. If we think of DNA as the blueprint, proteins are the decoration and furnishings. They are the molecules that bring the cell to life and determine how it functions. The final number and precise nature and structure of the proteins being determined by the cells and bodies precise requirements at that time. This image is of a section through a cell showing its nucleus, cytoplasm and other internal structures called organelles. Within the nucleus, the DNA is double-stranded. When a stimulus from outside or inside the cell requires the cell to change its internal chemistry, part of a length of double-stranded DNA unwinds and is used to make a single-strand, complementary replica of itself called messenger RNA. The messenger RNA unlatches from the DNA and exits the nucleus into the cytoplasm. There it goes to specialized structures where it is used as a template for producing a protein. Initially, the protein consists only of a string of its component parts, amino acids, represented here by the blue dots. So that it exactly meets the requirement of the cell and the body, the function of the protein is fine-tuned by structural add-ons and complex shape changes. Some proteins are used by the cell to allow it to function. And others are secreted, allowing the cell to influence its wider environment. The first group of proteins includes enzymes, molecules that help cells work in precisely the right way. And in the second group are molecules like hormones and tissue structural materials that give tissues and organs shape. These modifications are important, allowing the 33,000 genes in the human nucleus to be responsible for the production of at least 1 billion proteins, all of which have very precise, distinctive functions. How do we detect and interpret the proteins present within mummies? Mummification through dehydration preserves tissues, cells and molecules like proteins. As molecules degrade almost from the moment of death, the more rapid and thorough the mummification, the better preserved are the proteins. However, some degradation is inevitable. Proteins degrade by breaking down into shorter lengths called peptides. In natural degradation, it is not possible to predict where these proteins break. The proteins we looked at in Takabuti came from a needle biopsy of the muscles at the back of the thigh. Needle biopsy is used in living patients, 
it does minimal damage, but the downside is that the sample produced is very small. In Takabuti, the sample consisted of just some brown dust. This is not a problem for proteomics, as we can work with tiny amounts of material. Just how little I have illustrated using a 20 pence piece. We use 5 milligrams, which is the equivalent of a volume of the 20p defined by the brown dot, which is half the size of the Queen's earring. The first thing we do with the sample is to solubilize it and lyse any cells to release intracellular proteins. We then separate the proteins from other molecules and bits of cells to form a tiny pellet of pure protein. This is resolubilized and run on a gel. The gel is a bit like a molecular sponge. When a very high voltage is applied across it, the proteins and bits of proteins, themselves carrying a charge, move through the gel. The distance they move and where they end inside the gel is dependent on their size, which influence how easily they can move through the pores in the molecular sponge, and their charge, which determines how hard they are pulled by the current. When the process reaches completion, the gel is removed and stained with a blue stain that visualizes the proteins and peptides. Normal undegraded proteins form distinct lines as shown by the yellow arrow, but the degraded mummy proteins form a long smear as shown by the green arrow. Normally the individual proteins will be cut out with the bit of gel therein and then analyzed. This is not possible with ancient degraded proteins. Instead, we divide the whole gel into blocks, here labelled A1 to A5 and B1 to B5, and analyse each one. This would not normally be possible, but the Proteomics Centre at the University of Manchester undertakes Discovery Proteomics, which enables us to search for hundreds of proteins in the same sample. First, the sample is digested into peptides of known size and then undergoes highly specialized mass spectrometry to separate and measure the individual peptides. The top right image shows three of our eight discovery mass spectrometers. The image on the bottom right is a readoff from the thousands of peptides being analyzed by the machine. The problem with discovery proteomics is the amount of data coming off each mass spectrometer. We run all the data through a series of very complex algorithms, many of which we've devised ourselves in our computer suite. The data that are derived by this means are not specific pieces of information, but likelihoods, which is the best that we can, be a, that we can achieve on pre-degraded ancient proteins. From Takabuti, we were able to identify and measure several hundred proteins. The 20 on this bar chart are some of the 73 with a very high confidence, effectively demonstrating that these are real proteins and that we've measured real amounts of those proteins. Most of the molecules are structural, the ones in pink directly relating to the contractile structures within skeletal muscle cells. Other are enzymes required for cells to function, the one in plum colour being specific for muscle. Two other key proteins are also shown in this chart. Whenever you are working with tiny amounts of ancient material, there is always a risk of contamination with modern proteins. Fortunately, as proteins age, their components naturally change in a predictable way. Our discovery proteomics can pick this up. The bar chart shows modifications within the detected proteins that characterize ancient proteins, allowing us to be confident that the molecules we have detected come from Takabuti's leg. We did detect some contaminants, 
mainly from bacteria and fungi that had invaded the tissue at some time since mummification. So what have we shown? First, that we can use discovery proteomics on only 5 mg of tissue to define and measure the proteome of partially degraded tissue from a mummy that is 2,600 years old. Second, we have been able to show that these were ancient proteins and not contaminants, although we were able to identify proteins from infective organisms and distinguish them from other ancient proteins. And third, that at the time of her death, Takabuti had been using her leg muscles hard. She was capable of running. In view of Dr. Loyne's discoveries about her cause of death, we can hypothesize a scenario in which she had been running for a little while, probably fleeing the person who eventually killed her with a savage blow to her back from a sharp, heavy weapon. In summary, we have shown that it is possible to undertake meaningful molecular studies on tiny amounts of tissue, employing those techniques routinely used in live patients, which cause minimal damage. We can now add to the techniques of modern Egyptology, facial reconstruction, radiocarbon dating, histology, and the most advanced imaging, molecular studies that broaden our understanding of individuals events and people living along the Nile in antiquity.